Well, welcome you all. I'm glad uh, you decided to join my talk today. My name is Mike Cohen. Thanks for the intro. Uh, I'm a technical fellow at Indeed. I work in our API uh, and routing platform group. Uh, Indeed's mission is to help people get jobs, and my team largely enables other teams in uh, achieving that mission. Um, I want to talk today about authorization with Open Policy Agent uh, and how that could be applied to uh, GraphQL, and specifically today, Apollo Router. Uh, I'll show you how we can write authorization policies in a standard domain agnostic language that's decoupled from uh, your application code uh, and in a way that minimizes bugs and failures. Uh, so like all good talks in the, author in the security track here, I'm going to start by defining what authorization is, and I'm going to compare that uh, to authentication. Uh, so just for clarity, authentication is about identifying who the user is uh, or perhaps who, a work who, uh, who the workload is. Um, so we're likely doing some sort of credential, credential verification, perhaps usually in password, fingerprint scanner, et cetera. Uh, um, uh, the user acquires some sort of token, and that token is passed around as uh, proof of their identity. Authorization, on the other hand, is the process of verifying who a user is. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> what a user has access to. Um, so, so with authorization, with that um, access token in hand, for example, uh, you verify that the user on the other end of the request is able to retrieve the data they're attempting to retrieve or take some action. Uh, so just some really straightforward examples to sort to drive that point home. We, we may need to ver verify that Sally can post a job for some company uh, or that you know, service A could send invoices for company Y. Uh, um, or can Roger read this resume that he's attempting to read? We've all written code like this. Um, and what I want to make a case for today is that you might benefit from some sort of general purpose policy enforcement like Open Policy Agent. Um, the way that we build software has, has changed quite a bit in, in recent years. Um, teams are, uh, our industry really has largely moved to the cloud. We've decomposed monoliths and turned them into microservices. Uh, you're probably building microservices. Your subgraphs are very likely microservices. Um, and in fact, at Indeed, as was alluded to, we actually have around 200 subgraphs uh, and, and counting. Um, so we have more services, more components, more interactions that require some sort of authorization check. Um, <clears throat> these access control decisions happen in many, many more places than, than has historically been the case. Uh, and, and to make that perhaps a bit more difficult, uh, we, we tend to write services in different languages. Um, at Indeed, Java is prevalent. It's the most common language. Um, but we also have subgraphs in Python, Node, and at least one in Rust now. Uh, Go is a popular language at Indeed, and I'm sure you all, uh, many of you have had similar experiences. <clears throat> we also have some uh, realities to deal with here. Um, manual policy enforcement is error prone. Uh, and in fact, broken authorization is a very common exploit. Uh, bespoke enforcement is, is really difficult to review. Uh, you know, if, even if you have 5, 10, or 20 subgraphs and not 200, uh, you may find yourself with 5 or 20 different ways or different variations that teams have chosen to enforce authorization policies. That's really difficult to review and, and get right. Um, <clears throat> imagine uh, a security-minded engineer or, or, or even perhaps a firm you've hired to audit your application reviewing authorization policies across your code base. And then imagine you have 200 subgraphs like we do. Um, I'll also point out that manual policy enforcement is time intensive and, and, and so costly. It, it takes time to get right. This is where open policy agent, where you might find benefit in something like open policy agent. 
Uh, it's a domain agnostic uh, general purpose policy engine. Um, it allows us to uh, decouple and offload policy making decisions from enforcement. What I mean by that is you can write policies in a language provided by OPA um, and keep those separate from your application code. And we'll look at an example of that. Uh, it, as I mentioned, it does include a, a declarative language that allows you to specify policy as code. We'll, we'll talk about some of the advantages of that. And it's also a, a mature project. It's a CNCF graduated project that's used pretty widely. So let's look at an example of how an a typical application might use Open Policy Agent. Here, uh, this is just a typical request processing application. A request arrives at the service. The service collects some input. The, the input here would be the input required by the policy. Uh, that input is sent to Open Policy Agent. Open Policy Agent makes the policy decision the, the authorization decision, if you will, and returns that decision as structured output, as JSON. Let's dig into that and look at an example together. Um, and, and we'll look at an example of Rego, which is the name of the policy language that ships with OPA. Again, it's a purpose-built language that's meant for specifying policies. But first, uh, let's look at just a very simple schema that we'll use throughout the rest of this presentation. Uh, so here we have just a single mutation defined uh, named post job uh, that takes not enough to actually post a job, but it's what fit on my slide. So we're going to go with that. And then uh, just an example of how you might, uh, an operation that makes use of that uh, um, mutation. And this is a very simple rego policy. Let, let's walk through this together. Um, the, the very first line here you see, I've uh, defined a package named subgraph.jobs. So the idea here is that uh, you, one, one way you may choose to make use of uh, open policy agent is to allow subgraph authors to own their policy. And that's uh, that's the approach I'm demonstrating here. There would be perhaps a policy per subgraph. On the next line, I'm importing the in keyword, and then I specify a default for the allow rule of false. We're going to restrict access by default. Um, and then finally, you see a rule named allow here. Um, <clears throat> and you'll note that here we're, we're making use of some input. Um, Rego policies expect input. Input is needed. Um, and so here, uh, the input that the application would provide is uh, a field indicating uh, which field uh, the user would like to access, in this case, the post-job mutation, um, and some basic information about the user. Uh, that input might look something like this. So here I've specified a field of mutation.postjob and very simple uh, information about a user, in this case, just a single role named job colon post. And as you've probably figured out, in this case, uh, the allow rule would evaluate to true and the user would be permitted access. Now, I have to say that um, uh, this would also, if, the, if a user tried to do anything else, if you had any other field, this would also evaluate to false. So we have more work to do here, uh, but hopefully this helps illustrate how the regular language works. So uh, just thinking about what we've seen, um, uh, we're able to express policy as code. We're able to do that in a way that's decoupled from our application logic. And we're using a purpose-built language uh, that's meant for this. Um, so we get, you know, you can imagine benefits there. Once, once proficient, there's productivity improvements. Uh, security professionals are able to review this code in a more straightforward manner. Um, Rego's exceptionally performant, so you, you get some performance advantages. And also, your authorization policies uh, 
can be kept under version control in, in, in a very you know, straightforward, clear way. You know where those policies are. You know where they're expressed. You don't have to go searching around the code base to find them. So let's talk about how you get policy decisions from Open Policy Agent. Uh, there are a few options. Uh, the agent includes a REST API. There's a Go API. And you can also compile policies as WebAssembly binaries uh, and then evaluate and then get policy decisions uh, um, using libraries that support that. Uh, there's a node package and some others that the, I believe the node package is actually officially supported by um, the maintainers of Open Policy Agent, and there are some community contributed libraries as well. We're going to look at REST, and I'll walk through an example here. <clears throat> uh, um, uh, what we see here is uh, a uh, very simple signature for the uh, decision API, if you will, um, the path in the HTTP request identifies the policy decision to ask for, uh, and the input is provided as part of the body. So following our example, uh, uh, this is the shape of the request that we would use to ask for a policy decision uh, for the jobs subgraph in our example. Uh, and of course, the path here, subgraph slash jobs, corresponds to the package name in that rego policy we looked at previously, uh, and allow refers to the, the rule name in that package. Uh, given the input that we see here, the policy that we authored previously, uh, we would expect the agent to respond with a result that looks like this, where allow the result of the allow rule is true. So as you can see here, decisions are returned as structured JSON. <clears throat> you might be concerned about performance. Let's take a minute to talk about that. Um, a very common way, call it a best practice, uh, for deploying open policy agent would be um, as a sidecar container uh, or perhaps as a host level daemon. Uh, really what's meant by that is simply that um, the agent is deployed side by side with the application that needs decision making. Um, so uh, digging in here just a little bit, we'll follow the Kubernetes example. If you use Kubernetes, you're, you, you'll be somewhat familiar with this. The dotted line represents a pod. We have two containers within that pod, the main container, which is your application, and the OPA container, which is the container we're gonna, your application would communicate with to get policy decisions. Um, this gives us uh, low latency, low overhead policy decisions. Um, if you're familiar with the si sidecar model, much like the external coprocessor, uh, the, the benefits of communicating within the pod is um, that containers within the pod share the a networking namespace. Uh, so you simply communicate with localhost. Um, and uh, often, typically I'll say, uh, that containers within the pod are actually executing on the same Kubernetes node. Uh, so you should expect very low latency here related to the call. Uh, also worth noting, the agent will keep all policies and data needed to give to, to make policy decisions in memory. And uh, taking this just a little bit further, um, if you've uh, deployed a service mesh, this will look somewhat similar. Um, though, though this doesn't come out of the box, it is possible, uh, really, OPA was designed for distributed policy enforcement. Um, so it's possible to deploy OPA in a way that would give you automatic policy distribution, um, decision telemetry, so logs about decisions that were, that were made, um, and agent telemetry along with centralized management. So how do we use this? Uh, from here forward, um, I want to show you how you could use open policy agent uh, with the Apollo router and external coprocessing. Uh, and before we get too far into that, let's review quickly 
uh, how external co-processing works. Many of you are familiar with this. Um, <clears throat> we're going to enable the subgraph service in the external coprocessor. And what that will do is uh, um, instruct router to make a call to the coprocessor. So, so query planning happens, then router will actually call the uh, coprocessor before making a request to the subgraph. So we'll quickly walk through that here. Uh, request arrives uh, at router, router does query planning and all the other magical things it does. Um, and then since we've configured the router in this way, uh, it will make a request to your coprocessor. Uh, you then have, the, the coprocessor, coprocessor then has the ability to manipulate execution flow. So we could terminate the request, terminate request processing altogether. We could simply say continue, everything looks good. Um, there's more to this, but I'll leave it at that for now. Um, after the coprocessor request, router will actually make a call to the subgraph. Here's a very simple configuration. Uh, so I've enabled, I, I've configured a coprocessor at localhost. <clears throat> uh, I've enabled the subgraph service, um, and I've uh, specified that I want headers, body, context, and the service name. So let's write some code. Let's look at some code. And I'm using TypeScript. Um, walking through this here uh, at the beginning, I'm grabbing the request body that I received from router. And, and uh, the reason for this is, and you'll see this on the next slide, um, the, way, the way you manipulate or, or um, control behavior and, and change um, what the router will do is by, so you get this request body from router. If you simply echo that back, router will do what it planned. It, no changes, it won't change anything. If you manipulate that body and return something different than what you received, uh, router will take whatever action you told it to. So um, we'll walk, I'll, I'll explain that a bit more in a second. So we grab the request body that we received from router. We pluck the service name out of that, <clears throat> stuff it into a subgraph variable. And then you'll see this path should look very similar. Uh, this is essentially the post request that we made that, that I demonstrated previously on that earlier slide. Um, so we're gonna send a post request at subgraph slash jobs slash allow and we'll stuff the result into a variable that I've named allow here. Um, <clears throat> so we have that request body, we have a decision from open policy agent. Um, and if that decision was true, in other words, uh, allowed, uh, we'll simply return the request body that we received from router. And again, that's, that, that we're, we're, we're by doing that, we're telling router that we want it to proceed as usual. Um, if not, if the policy decision was uh, not allowed, if allow is false, um, I'm sorry if you're not familiar with TypeScript JavaScript, but essentially what we're doing here is uh, the, the else part of this ternary operator is using the spread operator to take request body and replace some fields. So, I'm replacing the control and body fields that came with that request body. Uh, the control field, I'm telling it to break. So this will terminate request execution. Uh, this will tell router to terminate request execution and to return a 403 response code. Uh, and then I'm also adding an error. Uh, I'm adding an errors field that has one error in it. Now, your error should be better than this, uh, but this is, Again, what fit on the slide. <clears throat> so when not authorized, router will skip the call to the subgraph, in fact, terminate request processing. Um, and when somebody sends a mutation like this uh, and doesn't have the appropriate permissions, it will receive a response like this from router. So summary. Um, <clears throat> what I've walked through today is uh, th th there is clear need in some organizations uh, 
for a general purpose policy engine, we have many, many more interactions that require some sort of policy decision. Uh, OPA is a, a policy engine that's mature and general purpose. Um, we can deploy it in a way that gives us low latency and highly available policy decisions. We can write policy as code. We talked about some of the many, many benefits of that. A couple of them are you know, decoupling and um, the, the ability to maintain them very simply in version control. Uh, and then I demonstrated how uh, you might integrate OPA with uh, the external coprocessor. That is my talk. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter at Mike underscore Cohen. And I've got a topic table um, in just under an hour, uh, table five. Hope to see some of you there. Thanks.